Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Neil Shapiro, President and CEO of WNET. WNET and its family of public media companies bring quality arts, education, and public affairs programming to more than 5 million viewers each week. WNET produces and presents such acclaimed PBS series as Nature, Great Performances, American Masters, PBS NewsHour Weekend, and our favorite Charlie Rose. Neil has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Neil, for joining us today. My pleasure. Public television, public broadcasting is such a gift. Talk about public, the public and public broadcasting. Well, it's a great question, and, and more and more you can see the distinction between commercial media and public media. Public media really belongs to people. It's funded by people. That's why we say viewers like you. And it means that we can do, we can really fit in where there's market failure. And you can probably see that so clearly where television is going now, where reality is sort of consuming so much of television. So we do things that are important because they're important. And when we look back at the history of civilizations and say what defines civilizations, it's defined by the intelligentsia, by the great work. And that's what we aim to do. So in a world where there's no real place for arts and culture except on public television. Why is that? Because things like even A&E and Bravo, which were once uh, founded with the idea that they would fill this niche, in fact, commercial television does what it does. It sells eyeballs. It tries to get the most amount of people. It's not consumed because there's no way to measure the intensity of experience. There's no way to measure how TV touches your intellect or touches your spirit. But that's what public media does. So we reach a lot of people, but we reach them in more profound ways. And because of that, we can do things that are important because they're important, not necessarily because they reach a lot of people. I think when we look at things, we say, is there some value to this beyond just is it interesting? And I think all the things, even our drama, something like Downton Abbey, which is a gigantic hit, is not just a great piece of drama, not just well-written, but it is about style and manners and history. You know, part of the reason that we do so well in this kind of costume drama or sophisticated drama that we do is because it's different, because it's still, there's something unique about what we do. And that's because there is something about educational, inspirational in everything we do. And I would say that often stands apart from many things you see here on commercial television, which are just about reaching people. No one will remember next year who got kicked off the island. Right? No one will remember five years from now which squabbling divorced couple said what to whom. But people remember years from now you know, the drama that they saw 20 years ago and how it changed their life. People remember, you know, I hear from people all the time who have had their lives changed by public television. And the other day I heard from someone who said, you know what, I'm a marine biologist. And I am because from a young age I watched nature and that showed me what I wanted to do. When we watch your programming, we see the before camera uh, talent. We see the actors of, of Downton Abbey. We see uh, the interviewers, people like Charlie Rose. But in order to enable those performances, in order to provide that, that news programming, you have a huge number of people who contribute, who are really the enablers of these performances. Talk about how the organization is actually constructed in this and the scope of your operations. You know, in, in broad strokes, people may not realize the army it takes behind the scenes to get something on the air. And so, but if you think about the narrow group of people you actually see on the screen, behind them there's a whole production team, which may be doing the writing, the producing, the camera work, the editing, and there's a lot of them. And then below them, there's all the people. There's a, then there's a technical support, which actually edits and gets things on the air. And below them, there's a whole other layer, which is the fundraising mechanism that makes all this happen. And you know, in broad strokes, when I look at my station, there's about a third of the people who, one way or another, are involved in raising money. Uh, you know, what makes our work rewarding and wonderful is that we do things that other people can't. What makes it rigorous and exhausting is we have to raise the money to do it. Right. right? And that's not just the few times a year when we interrupt shows occasionally and say, for pledge drives, would you please support this program? There's something uh, much larger and deeper, which is raising hundreds of millions of dollars we have to raise to put these programs on the air. And in order to do that, you have to raise attention, you have to raise awareness, you have to start the process of transforming that awareness into a gift, and then also build a relationship so that the person who is giving the gift is receiving uh, a th a thanks and, and receiving some sort of recognition so that they will in turn feel a sense of satisfaction not only in the, through the listening but also through the interaction. So it's a very sophisticated process. It is in no way transactional. You are building a family. That's exactly right. 
and it's increasingly challenging uh, in this world we live in, but also there are new possibilities in doing it because you can relate to people in so many different ways. And um, in the world of social media, you can relate to them in different ways. But you're right that it is all about, I think for all nonprofits, but especially for us, establishing a link with people. And the few times when I go on there, I often say to people, you know, you can sit there and not do anything. Or believe me, if you make a contribution, you're going to feel so much better about yourself. You're going to have the psychic reward that you watch something on TV and say, I helped make this possible. The fact is, across public media, and I think we do great work, it's about one out of ten people who watch actually contribute. So nine out of ten don't. And that would, you know, if that were eight out of, you know, if a two or three out of ten did, that would change the economy of what we do. So one thing we talk about and try to tell people is, remember, when you fund our program, it's not just the programs. We talk about the, lo the lasting value these programs have. A little bit in what I talked about before, the way that you'll never recognize how many lives you've touched, how many careers you've launched, how many uh, homes you've comforted right. by the programs you do. But beyond that, there's a whole educational aspect to our programs. So we have PBS Learning Media, which is in every single state, which provides free educational material to students and teachers. We live in this visual age, so now we can take our material and we make it little bite-sized bits and integrate into lesson plans. So students can learn by video instead of just by having teachers right. talk. Right. That's a fantastic thing. Um, and to know that there's a whole educational platform attached to our work. And video being able to be cut up now and distributed in, in tiny uh, sort of social media uh, chunks and, and, and that potential is so interesting. Right. In terms of, of how you uh, interact with um, your, your funding base, the other aspect is that you have pursued a purposeful strategy of narrowing and not necessarily diversifying your revenue streams into the commercial sector. You have strict limits on how commercial speech occurs with, and how commercial speech can actually affect your programming. Talk about those, those policies and yeah. how, you, how you think right. about that. So we are, we are limited both by, by federal requirements and by our own rules about how little, frankly, commercial uh, influence there is on our programs. There are, there are short commercial messages, 30 seconds, and more than three at the top and the bottom of the program. After that, they're uninterrupted. The sponsors obviously have no say in the editorial content, and even their messages are different. So in commercial television, you cannot do anything that's comparative. You can't say Ford twice as good as Chrysler, and you can't do any call to action. You can't say sale begins Tuesday. If you think about it, that's a big aspect of almost everything else you see on television. There's no, right, it's all about, so the messages we have tend to be much more pro-social. There's something about, you know, a company that believes in making the world a safer place. Well, this is a good thing for a chance for companies to show up that they want to be good corporate citizens. But it does limit the, what they call the creative, the, right. the millions of dollars people put into selling something which doesn't work on public media. In terms of the infrastructure that you also have to run the business, in other words, the finance people and all that, I mean, you, you also run as a standard business. So you have attorneys, you have uh, accountants, you have all the people who ensure that your systems work, your infrastructure, your telecommunications. I mean, you have all that infrastructure that is so costly that a major uh, network might have. How do, you, uh, how do you manage to remain at the cutting edge given your limited budget uh, constraints? Part of it's had to take the discipline within the company to say, you know what, we need to be nimble and quick. We need to force ourselves to try to make sure our production standards are keeping with the times. I mean, that's, I th my experience is harder in nonprofits than in for-profits, not just because the money isn't always there to do it, or as much as you'd like. There's also a mindset, which is to remind people that even though we believe in the eternal values that we believe in, we don't believe in the eternal ways of production. In other words, as technology changes and viewership changes, we have to change too, without compromising the things we believe in. As an executive and for people who work for me, that is a challenge. In some ways, it's a bigger challenge in public media. Um, but it's one more thing we say to our funders. So we've, we've raised money to make sure that our content is everywhere. So we, we're, we now have an, I, uh, an iPad app. We're the only public television station that has one at the moment, though <laughs> over time everyone will. And we're on every mobile device. Now, we didn't used to be that way, but thought, you know, we cannot be what we were 20 years ago, which is we'll have a VHS tape library and you can get things where you want. If you don't stay with the times for any nonprofit, but especially in communications, right, at the end of the day, you'll be gone. How do you determine where your next investment in programming will be uh, made? Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, eventually you spiral into irrelevance. Um, it really does come down, I think, to uh, first understanding where we think the need is, then making a credible case to our funders. This is what we need. 
So some things, uh, I'll give you an example. We're, we just launched a local show called Theater Close-Up. It's about off-Broadway shows. I've known for four years I wanted to do this show. Um, and we tried a few experiments, which, um, but I sort of thought you needed a footprint to do it. And it took four years to raise the money to tell funders, this is really important, um, we should do it. Now having said that, we've done it. And we achieved two things. We got the audience I thought we would get on TV. But we realized the kind of impact we, we weren't quite sure we would have. Um, and that was not just the audience responded in big ways, but we helped the groups we were profiling. So the two theaters, we first two theaters we did, small theaters, the first theater, the moment the play went off the air, people started calling to subscribe for next year's season. The next play we did was going to be in the red, and after we aired that play, they ended up in the black. One thing that we can do, because I think public media does bring a certain halo effect, that part of our job as curators to make sure we put things on the air that we believe in, and that by doing that, we can bring new talent to the forefront. And if you look back at our archives over the year, we have Meryl Streep's first performance on television. We have young stars like Kevin Klein, a bunch of them, all of whom we've shot when they were young. And so I wanted to revive this series to say the next great stars are off-Broadway now. I want to look back in 20 years and say we found them. The same can also be said about your programs that cover the sciences or that cover uh, different educational uh, areas. A, um, an academic, a team that is toiling in isolation is going to have a lot of difficulty finding the, the resources to advance their work, whether it's in medical research or whether it's in uh, natural sciences, or whether it's in uh, architecture or various forms of art, attention creates space for that creation. Without attention, it's so difficult to, to pursue that type of knowledge. So you are also embedding yourself as part of a sort of ecosystem strengthening um, uh, device. You, in, in many respects, you become the, the megaphone, the voice, for those people who are creating this wonderful work. And we, we have launched a new show last year called SciTech Now, like sci-fi. Right. Uh, and the idea is to do precisely that, to show off emerging scientists, breakthroughs in making science understandable to the rank and file. And part of the reason we did it is we did some, some uh, research and said, you know, there's a whole next generation of viewers. Um, and they are younger, they are more involved in their community. Um, they care about local arts and culture, and they care about science and technology. They are the people who buy all the new gadgets. And we want to make sure, you know, at the same, we're delighted to super serve an audience that loves opera and super serve an audience that loves Downton Abbey. We want to super serve this audience, too. Now, you come from a very interesting background because you were not always in public media. Indeed. I spent 26 years in commercial television at the ABC News and NBC News. Talk about that experience. Well, on the one hand, it was a great, and I felt lucky. I think I lived, I'm not sure I realized at the time, but I lived through the golden age of TV news, um, a time when I think for a lot of the, my time there, there was still a sense it was about serving the public, and there was uh, a little less attention paid to ratings and a little less attention paid to budgets. Um, and over time, as the companies I worked for got bigger and as my jobs got more important, um, I found I was spending much more time worrying about the budgets and less time about creativity. Um, and as I see what's happening in to even commercial news, it's changed. Um, it is more part of a larger company. It has to do great work, but it also has economic masters to serve. Um, and after 26 years there, I was looking for something new and found my way to public media. And I must say it is, you know, and I worked in commercial television, I would get uh, a minute, a mi ratings by a minute, a report of ratings minute by minute. I would get a, a ratings report minute by minute, which showed me exactly how the show was doing minute by minute. You could see what would happen, and you could see every time a commercial fell, the audience would go. And you could try to be smart and figure out what can I do to try to make sure that, that I, I don't lose. And while there was an intellectual um, reward to that, but trying to do it, um, and you could try to say, how can I still tell the stories I want to tell and still keep those ratings, you were very conscious all the time what those ratings were. And conscious that even when you did something really, really important, I worked at Dateline for a long time, and sometimes we would do what I would call really serious PBS quality documentaries, the ratings are always lower than some juicy murder trial. It, it is a fact of life. Um, so to come to a place now where, you know what, if you want to do an important documentary, go do it, is incredibly fulfilling. How does that idea of, of creating texture inform your work today in, in comparison to your work previously? Do you not pay attention at all to ratings? No, I think yeah, it would be foolish to do that because you still want to know who's, who's watching. Right. You want some sense of that. It's uh, your audience. Your yeah. audience is irrelevant. Who's paying right. attention is, is right. relevant. Right. But I think that the huge difference is, one, is the difference of time. 
because even the best newscast, whatever it is, is 22 minutes once you strip out all the commercials, and when you strip out the intros, it's probably less than that. Right. So by definition, your stories can't be very long, because you have to intersperse the commercials. So the news hour, which is an hour. And long stories can't be told, because, exactly. they're, because they're long. Right, so just logistical, you can't tell them. Even if you wanted to, you just can't do it. Right? Um, so the news hour can comfortably take 10, 12, 13, 14 minutes if they need to on something. That's, that's one thing. The time allows you to do things. And the other thing is because you're not driven by ratings. You know, when I'm struck by the news hours, often I'll watch it and say, there are stories I saw there I didn't see anywhere else. There was a right. hearing on the Hill about food stamps I didn't see anywhere else. Why? Because it doesn't fit into the small 22-minute news hole. There's no compelling way to tell it in two minutes. It's people talking. And the larger topics you want to dive into don't allow for time on commercial television, and it may not give you the ratings you want. You know, I mean, when you do commercial television, you know after a while, there's so, you know, for instance, overseas stories are d more difficult. Right. And Americans tend to be more in source society, and they tend not to be care what's happening overseas. The public media audience is sort of the opposite. In fact, they're curious about the world, and if you explain the relevance, they'll give you a lot of time to talk about that. And the guests are often not the guests that are great with the soundbite. They're the guests who are great with the paragraph to explain and to connect. Um, you have a, a different type of dynamic when people are given a little bit more time, even the interactions amongst guests and how the interview actually unfolds and what is encouraged to be revealed is, is completely different in, in, in this time. Frame. I think it's really about do you want light or do you want heat? Right? Uh, if, if you want to rub things together, you get a lot of heat, right? So right. if you want screaming, shout, you know, people screaming at each other, there are plenty of cable channels that can provide that for you. If you want light, if you want more time to understand what the issues are and take a deeper dive into substance, then public media is where you should be. It must be tremendously satisfying for your writers, for your journalists, to find in this environment a haven for real professional journalism as opposed to this what what is called journalism, but but too often is is simply about that that uh, soundbite that 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 attracts attention. How do you feel that that the journalistic um, the, the the media field, since you've seen the evolution from the golden age of television and 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 media exposure, in which you had real journalism being committed on a daily basis, to a situation right now where we have so many young people who are so engaged, who are becoming trained as journalists, but they come out and they can't find a, a, a place. How do you feel about the evolution of the sector? Uh, I think that it's probably changing faster than anybody knows, and it'll be interesting to see what young people bring to it. Uh, I think actually what we're in this multi-platform world, and where I think it's exciting about where local news is going is, um, those young people may find a place, and it may not be at the networks anymore. That used to be the what is viewed as the pinnacle of the profession. And in some ways, I think it still is. The people who do that are extraordinarily talented, even if they can't always use all their talents in the way they want to. But young people are going to come out, they'll, they're multi-platform skilled, they can write, report, produce, shoot, edit, um, blog, work on all kinds of platforms. Um, I think more of them are gravitating to public media, because they're saying it's a place we can work, we have the place to do it. Um, and in time, I think we may see a swing for people who are civically, among people who are civically engaged, who want to know just what happened, not just what happened that day, but why and what difference it makes, that they may find increasingly public media is the place for them. And there might be a change from the broadcast distribution channel to an internet-based distribution channel to a mobile distribution channel. So how that information is conveyed and the depth to which people can go, which would, in this particular case, in this world, can be self-selected, might result in a, another shift at, at an organization like WNET to accommodate these new technologies. You know, I mean, 20, we think 20% of our viewing audience now is not based on our primary channel, but on the digital channels, right, which when they first launched thought who would watch that. But in fact, we have a 24-7 kids channel, we have a 24-7 news, long form news channel, we have a 24-7 sort of practical how-to channel, all those do incredibly well. Now Shapiro, this is such an interesting story, and it's an evolving story. I'm sure as we as we blink, everything will will change, mm -hmm. and and the distribution channels will change, the content will change, the the uh, the wonderful performances will be refreshed. You'll expand from off Broadway to off off Broadway mm -hmm. into new uh, areas that none of us can even consider. Thank you so much for sharing the experiences that you've had at WNET. And thank you so much for your insight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.